Okay, moving down the spine, the important thing to note here, well, there are two important things to note. Obviously, there is a fracture, but if you didn't spot that this spine is otherwise fused, you might actually miss it. It, it is almost faking like a normal disc space. See that there and that there. But look at the disc spaces themselves. There are these longitudinally oriented calcific densities bridging the disc spaces on all views. Okay, so this is a case of ankylosing spondylitis. And when you see that, you have to be particularly astute and vigilant in looking for an associated fracture. Uh, these fused ankylosing spondylitis spines become very stiff and inflexible and are particularly at risk for fractures. And when they get fractures, they can look very subtle. They can go right through a disc space, right? But this is pretty unstable, right? Even though it looks pretty normal. So I've seen this missed. Uh, in fact, I think ankylosing spondylitis fractures uh, factor heavily in medical malpractice cases. They seem to really be prevalent because they're hard to spot. Um, the other thing about these is if you see a fracture in an ankylosing spondylitis spine, recommend that the entire spine be imaged. They typically don't break in just one place when the entire spine is fused, again, because of that fusion and inflexibility. And I'm sure I've told you guys before, if you're wondering about your diagnosis of ankylosing spondylitis, make sure you get a view of the sacroiliac joints and see that they are fused. If the sacroiliac joints are not fused, then whatever you're looking at in the spine is probably not ankylosing spondylitis. That is a pretty solid pearl. Uh, okay, so again, image the whole spine when you see a fracture in AS, and don't forget about the particular predisposition these people have to fractures, so you have to be particularly vigilant. Oh, and don't forget too, in patients with a history of recent intubation, uh, intubations, and I know I've shown you that uh, I've got a few cases of intubation-related ankylosing spondylitis fractures. They will, uh, when people intubate someone with AS and don't know that the patient has AS, which is frequently the case, they can get a low cervical or high thoracic uh, spine fracture related to that. Okay, so this is another case of ankylosing spondylitis. We can see again those longitudinally oriented. They don't go out like osteophytes, right? With ankylosing spondylitis fusion, it's a pretty straight line, longitudinally uh, craniocaudal, right? So it doesn't bulge out and it doesn't have the same substance to it that a bridging osteophyte would have. Okay, so we can spot that this is ankylosing spondylitis. And now look down the posterior aspect of the facet joints. You can see they actually make a solid line and you can't actually see any facet joint spaces. And that's common with ankylosing spondylitis. Ankylosing spondylitis will get you wherever you have synovium, right? That's why it fuses the anterior aspects of the sacroiliac joints. It's why it frequently will fuse the facet joints. I have seen panis formation in the synovium at C1, C2 from ankylosing spondylitis, which is usually attributed to rheumatoid arthritis. Right, so, uh, and the other one is the costotransverse joints, which of course you can't see on a plain film, but on CT, look for fusion of the costotransverse joints, uh, which you usually don't pay much attention to, but which will frequently be fused in AS as well. So this is a posterior element fracture. Look at that, it's just going right through these fused facet joints right there. And in fact, I would suspect that there's probably an occult fracture sitting uh, in that intervertebral disc space or uh, breaking these syndesmophytes, right? Because it most likely passed all the way through, right? So that's a posterior element fused facet joint fracture. Okay, a couple other lower spine fractures. This is a classic chance fracture. So a chance fracture has a vertebral compression fracture. 
And then you will typically, the classic chance fracture passes posteriorly uh, through the pedicles. And that actually was the case here. You just can't appreciate it on the plane film. But what you can see is the widening of the facet joints right here. Look down here, right? None of these is widened. In fact, you can't really see joint spaces, uh, which is fairly common in the lumbar spine. But here you can see a definite gap showing you that those facet joints are splayed. The chance fracture is the classic seatbelt fracture, uh, especially if someone is just wearing a lap belt as opposed to a shoulder harness, because it allows that hyperflexion in the mid portion. So this is a, just a, a classic auto accident fracture. Uh, this particular case was actually a woman, uh, I was a resident 30 years ago, and the University of Arizona uh, won the final four and everyone down on campus was partying and lighting fires and turning over cars, et cetera. And this uh, young woman was actually standing up in her car through the sunroof, uh, yelling and screaming and waving her arms and someone rear-ended the car in which she was. So she was bent over uh, on the, the gap in the roof. Uh, these fractures are frequently associated with visceral injury, and I think it's a good idea to recommend that, or suggest that possibility. When you see a chance fracture, there really should be some abdominal uh, imaging done, right? They often will have bowel contusions, pancreatic lacerations, and I've seen a few with aortic lacerations as well. So an association with visceral injury is the important thing to remember about these. And again, the classic one, goes through the pedicles and won't necessarily splay the uh, facet joints, uh, just depending on the particular vector of the force. So there you go, vertebral uh, compression fracture and splayed facet joints. All right, this is one that is typically atraumatic. So you can see there is a vertebral compression fracture, right, right there at L1. But the interesting thing is that there is this linear collection of gas that is definitely within the vertebral body. Okay, you can frequently get these linear gas collections in the disc spaces, and that's a perfectly normal phenomenon, right? They, uh, it, you have just recently cracked your back right? That's what will happen when you crack your back is the joint space, any, when you crack any joint, right? The joint space is abruptly expanded and that actually causes the nitrogen gas in the tissues to decompress essentially to fill that void. Uh, and so this is a common phenomenon. In fact, in the old days before discography, CTMR, uh, the old radiologist would have patients crack their backs and it would give you a free discogram, essentially. Uh, and similarly, in uh, hand films, you'll see people that have just cracked their knuckles will have nitro nitrogen gas in the disc spaces. Okay, but this, and I, I point that out because when I show this film to residents as a quiz question, they always blow it. They always just see that linear gas collection and write it off as disk space gas. And it clearly is not, right? You can see it's lying below the level of the superior uh, end plate. So this is a particular type of fracture. This is indicative of osteonecrosis. So this is osteonecrosis of calve cumel, almost always related to steroids. Uh, but certainly some kind of insufficiency is possible as well. But it's almost always related to uh, systemic steroid therapy. The important thing to note about this as well is it is always benign, right? It's not a pathologic fracture um, due to, say, an underlying uh, tumor or whatnot. It's a pretty good sign that all you've got is osteonecrosis. All right, so now we're off the spine and we're moving into uh, the shoulder. So this is a dislocation and it's a particular type of dislocation. And you can see the patient is actually stuck in this position. So these are not hard to diagnose clinically. The patient just comes in with their arm like this and can't put it down. 
so usually your imaging options are limited. They're not doing all kinds of internal, external rotations, et cetera. Uh, but, and, and the way that these happen is typically when someone is falling from a height and they reach out and grab something at the last second. So people falling from roofs that drop down and grab the gutter to save themselves, they're the, they're the type of, that's the type of mechanism that causes this injury. So this is known as luxatio erecta. And that is a just a particular type of dislocation. But you can see that the humeral head is not at all aligned with the glenoid fossa. All right, this is a particularly troublesome one on just a single view. And oftentimes you will need to confirm it with an axillary view, right? When you get an axillary view, you can really see the anterior posterior relationship of the humeral head to the glenoid fossa. And so it's the best way to diagnose dislocations of all types. Uh, but this particular frontal view really shows very nicely the classic finding of a posterior shoulder dislocation. So the humeral head is actually behind the glenoid fossa here. And what that does is it creates a trench, they call it trench sign, a divot in the more anterior portion of the humeral head, right? So uh, typically when you do these two, one thing, it, even if you don't have an axillary view, there, in someone with a dislocated shoulder, there's very little difference between their internal rotation and their external rotation films. And so when you look at internal and external rotation films and say, huh, there's no difference between these, start thinking, man, I need an axillary view, right? Because uh, that's a, a great soft sign that there is actually a, a shoulder dislocation. Uh, and remember, of course, it's very easy to remember uh, what internal rotation as opposed to external rotation look like. And there's a stupid mnemonic that I'll just share, uh, which is that internal uh, looks like a light bulb, which you use inside. And external rotation looks like a golf club, which you use outside. Right. So when that's how you can sort out internal and external rotation views when they're not labeled. So this is an internal rotation view and it's showing trench sign of a posterior shoulder dislocation. Posterior shoulder dislocations less common. Uh, when you see them, think of things like status epilepticus, lightning strike or uh, electrocution. And uh, lately I've uh, seen these happening more often because of snowboarders. Snowboarders, when they fall, they'll put their arms out and can dislocate posteriorly. One of my son's friends did that recently. All right, this one is pretty unusual. This was a blast injury. That's the history we got. I don't, uh, I tried to get the specifics of what exactly exploded. Uh, but sadly was thwarted. But you can see the scapula is dissociated completely from the thoracic cage and is rotated upwards. It's pretty dramatic, All right? So this is scapulothoracic dislocation. And the particular thing that you need to note about this is first of all, uh, sternoclavicular joint may be disrupted as well. And more importantly, these can be associated with vascular injury. Obviously, if you rotate the scapula to this degree, you may very well be disrupting uh, the axillary vessels. So this has a high association with vascular injury and probably a CTA of the chest is in order when you see something like this. Incidentally, do check the sternoclavicular joint as well. That is the only joint that links your whole upper extremity to your uh, axial skeleton, uh, even in the normal situation, right? All that's required for this injury to happen is for the tearing of all the uh, rhomboids and other muscles that attach the scapula to the thoracic, uh, to the posterior thorax. Uh, if you do see a sternoclavicular disruption that can be associated with these, that's also associated with vascular injury, especially when the 
head of the clavicle goes posteriorly, it can damage the great vessels in the superior mediastinum, another indication for a chest CTA.